Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome here to this evening's talk, um, titled Buddhist Theory of Mind. Um, I think we've got 90 minutes, although we're starting a little bit early, so we may have a little bit more time. And this is what I'd like to cover in this evening's talk. Um, with this, uh, with this um, topic, the Buddhist theory of mind, I'd like to first uh, introduce uh, an alternative theory of mind. I mean, of course, there are many theories of mind, um, but one that is very dominant in the scientific world, the theory of mind according to scientific materialism. Just briefly introduce that, because then we have something to compare with in terms of the Buddhist theory of mind. And then in the Buddhist theory of mind, I'd like to go through a number of points this evening. Uh, first, what is the mind according to Buddhism? Uh, where does it come from? Uh, what is its nature? How it functions? And then how to transform it. So that's the main points I'll be covering this evening. And then we'll have time for some uh, question answer at the end of the evening uh, on the points. So maybe actually before we start, it might be uh, good to just spend a few minutes to quiet the mind, relax the body. So let's do a little a bit of meditation to start this evening's talk. Just finding a nice, comfortable posture. Keeping the back nice and straight. And at the same time, allow the entire body to become completely relaxed, completely at ease. And using the out breath to relax and release any tightness or tension in any part of the body. bringing your awareness to the area of the face and softening and relaxing all the muscles in the face. The mouth and jaw soft and relaxed. And all the muscles around the eyes soft and relaxed. In this way allowing the entire body to become completely relaxed, completely at ease. And relaxing more deeply with each out breath. And with each out breath, letting go of any thoughts that may have arisen, happily releasing them.
is simply allowing the mind to come to rest in the present moment. And simply becoming aware of the rhythm of your breath. Noticing if it's slow or fast, deep or shallow, long or short. Without trying to modify it in any way. So simply becoming aware of the rhythm of the breath. Think about your motivation for coming here this evening. And then try to set the best possible motivation you can for attending this talk here this evening. So then, keeping this motivation in mind, we can begin our discussions here this evening. So again, I'd like to start by just briefly introducing uh, another theory of mind, uh, a theory of mind that is quite... Uh, common in the scientific field, and it's a theory of mind according to scientific materialism. And materialism is a, a view that the only thing that exists is matter, and that if anything else such as uh, mental events exists, then it's reducible to matter. And I've got a quote here from a quite a well-known physicist, Sean Carroll, and he says, based on this view, he says, we are collections of atoms operating independently of any immaterial spirits or influences. Under naturalism, there isn't much difference between a human being and a robot. We are all just complicated collections of matter, moving in patterns, obeying impersonal laws of physics in an environment within an arrow of time. So to talk about what this view has to say about mind, um, I'd like to read a little bit from a book from a well-known Buddhist author and practitioner, Alan Wallace, and he says the following. He says, uh, contemporary scientific materialism asserts that objective reality is composed entirely of matter and energy, and that reality has been that way since the origin of the universe. In this scientific system, Awareness, or in other words, mind, is an emergent property of the nervous system, and the nervous system is composed entirely of matter and energy. 
Scientific materialism offers quite a plausible account of the evolution from unconscious atoms and energy to the emergence of the human mind. This theory states that some point early in the history of the cosmos, if we accept the Big Bang theory, atoms formed into molecules. These molecules had new properties. A molecule such as water, H2O for instance, has qualities not found in either of its atomic components of hydrogen and oxygen, either individually or collectively. To take some of its obvious properties, water is wet at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it freezes at 32 degrees, and salts will dissolve in it. These attributes not found in the individual atoms of the water molecule are therefore called emergent properties of these molecules. So what he's saying is that in the process of evolution, as things became more complex, then new properties emerged. That when two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen molecule atom came together to form water, then we have new properties emerging of that water. Um, he says, organic molecules then combine to form single-celled organisms as well as viruses, which cannot be classified with certainty as either being living or non-living. In the former, life emerged as a property of the molecules that made up the cell. Eventually, the first cells with a neurosystem, such as Hydra, evolved. And from this point, we may speak of the emergent property of primitive awareness. So he's saying that uh, mind or consciousness simply came from a more complex configuration of matter and energy, particularly when we come to a, a primitive uh, nervous system, neurosystem. And then he finishes, he says, human consciousness with all its complexity, the theory concludes, is merely an emergent property of a far more sophisticated configuration of matter and energy, the human body, which evolved according to the laws of natural science. So in this um, uh, theory of mind, from scientific materialism, then the mind is either considered to be the brain, a, a, a function of the brain, or more commonly, an emergent property of the brain, that the mind is an emergent property of the brain. So here, basically, what we're saying in this theory of mind is that matter is primary, is fundamental, and that everything, including the mind, can be reduced in terms of matter and energy. And so therefore, in this system, then things like thoughts and emotions can be reduced to and explained as simply electrical signals and chemical flow in the brain. The thoughts and emotions are nothing more than this. And then he goes on and he says a bit more. He says, now let us return to the water molecule. If the configuration of its individual atoms is destroyed and the atoms separate, the unique properties of the water molecule do not go anywhere. They simply vanish, for the organization of matter and energy from which they arose is no longer present. This is equally true, according to scientific materialism, of the emergent property of awareness or mind, human or otherwise. When the neurosystem ceases functioning, materialists say, awareness disappears without a trace. The implications of this view concerning the nature of death are clear. Individual awareness vanishes, and only a decomposing configuration of matter and energy remain. So, of course, the implications of this theory of mind is that our mind began at the beginning of this life when our brain started functioning. And another implication of this view, of course, is at the end of our life, when the brain neurosystem ceases functioning, the mind will cease to exist. So that's one of the implications of this theory of mind. But of course, if we are to adopt this theory of mind, then we need to know what is matter and energy, because everything's based on the theory of matter and energy here. But here, uh, Alan Wallace, in his book, he says, the above theory is plausible and intelligently conceived. Its proponents go on to insist, however, that it is true and that incompatible theories are unscientific. If we are to adopt that theory as objectively true, we should have a sound understanding of what is meant by energy and matter. But here we run into problems. Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman asserts that modern science has no notion of what energy is. And while scientists believe almost unanimously in the existence of atoms, their views vary widely as to what atoms are. 
Some noted physicists believe that they are mere properties of space. Others contend they are sets of relationships, and still others, included noted physicist Werner Heisenberg, deny that they are material things at all. Particularly when venturing into the realm of quantum mechanics, we encounter statements by leading physicists that not only energy, but the entire array of elementary particles are simply constructs of our theories. Thus, physicist John Gribben even suggests that subatomic particles did not exist until they are observed in this century. So again, this theory is based on the, on the basis of everything is matter and energy. But again, here, it's not very clear what really matter and energy is. There's a little, lot of debate about that in science still today. And then, of course, the question is, how does conscious experience arise from the brain? How is it that we have this conscious experience of thoughts and emotions and so forth from purely electrical signals and chemical flow? And this is a very difficult question. It's often called the hard problem. How does conscious experience arise from physical activity in the brain? And they've been for many years now trying to come up with an answer and so far they've been unsuccessful. Um, and here I'd like to quote from a, a cognitive scientist, well-known cognitive scientist, Donald Hoffman, and he says, now Huxley, and he's talking about Thomas Huxley, with, who was a contemporary of Charles Darwin, he said, now Huxley knew that brain activity and conscious experiences were, are correlated, but he didn't know why. To the science of his day, this is the 19th century, um, it was a mystery. In the years since Huxley, science has learned a lot about brain activity, but the relationship between brain activity and conscious experiences is still a mystery. They haven't really come up with any answers. Um, and so it's called the heart problem. And some scientists have even gone to the extreme to, to get rid of the heart problem by saying that conscious experience actually does not take place. It's an illusion. I mean, that's one way of solving the problem, that there is no such thing as conscious experience, but, I mean, okay, if you want to say that, but I don't think that answers anything. So that's very briefly the scientific materialistic view of mind. So I'm not suggesting all scientists accept this, and of course not all scientists do. Just the branch of science that accepts that everything is, can be uh, understood in terms of matter and energy. So what I'd like to do now, of course, is for the rest of this uh, evening, is talk about the Buddhist theory of mind and how that differs from this theory we just briefly introduced. Well, first is, well, why is it important to understand the mind? Why is that important? And, of course, the Buddhist assertion is that it's the, uh, the underlying source of our happiness and the underlying source of our suffering lies within our own mind. So therefore, if we want to overcome suffering and find happiness, then we need to understand the mind. We need to understand its nature, we need to understand how it functions, and we need to understand how to transform it, how to overcome suffering and achieve happiness. So these are the topics that we'll go through. So first topic, what is the mind? So here, of course, um, terminology that when we speak very generally um, then we can say that mind, consciousness and awareness mean the same thing. But what we need to be careful of is this word awareness is, in, certainly in a Buddhist context, is used a lot, and it's often used to mean other things as well. But when we speak very generally, mind, consciousness, awareness mean the same thing. So what is mind? We can start with a simple definition of mind in Buddhism. So a simple definition of mind in Buddhism is that mind is that which is 
clear and knowing. Sometimes translated as mind is that which has clarity and awareness. And in this two-word definition, the first word is describing the entity that we're describing, and the second word is what does it do? For example, a simple definition of fire is fire is hot and burning. So what is the entity or nature of fire is heat. What does fire do? It burns. What is the entity or nature of the mind? Is the mind is clear or has clarity? What does the mind do? It knows, it is aware. So let's just unpack these two words a little bit more detail. So this word clear or clarity uh, really sort of implies two things here. The word clear or clarity, the mind being clear or having clarity, one thing it implies is that the mind is not physical. So it's not the brain, it's not a function of the brain, it's not an emergent property of the brain. The mind is mental, it's, it has no physical characteristics at all. And the second understanding of the word clear or clarity is because the mind is clear or has clarity means that uh, things can appear in it. Just like um, because a mirror is clear, reflections can appear in a mirror. Similarly, because a mind is clear or has clarity, therefore thoughts, emotions, images and memories can appear in the mind. What does the mind do? It knows, it is aware. The mind engages in those appearances. And so this is a very simple definition of the mind. So what we see here is, uh, with respect to the scientific materialistic view, of course, is that mind is not an emergent property of the brain. It's non-physical. It's not a physical entity. So therefore, from a Buddhist perspective, mind is fundamental in terms of nature of reality. It's not sort of like a byproduct of the brain, as is in the case here. Because uh, in the scientific materialistic view, the matter is primary and the mind is sort of secondary. It's not really, it's not part of the actual nature of reality. Whereas in Buddhism, mind is really fundamental, it's primary. And actually we see that uh, a number of quite well-known physicists have a similar viewpoint. So I'd like to just read a couple of quotes uh, from a couple of well-known physicists regarding this point. Um, first, a quote from uh, Max Planck, who, of course, won the Nobel Prize in physics, and he was really the originator of quantum theory. And he says the following, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. As a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about the atoms this much. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particles of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of a consciousness and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. And then uh, another quote from uh, Andre Linder, who's a, who's a professor of physics at Stanford University, uh, and he says the following. The current scientific model of the material world obeying laws of physics has been so successful that we forget about our starting point as conscious observers and conclude that matter is the only reality and that perceptions are only helpful for describing it. But in fact, we are substituting the reality of our experience of the universe with a conceptually contrived belief in an independently existing material world. Is it possible that consciousness, like time-space, has its own intrinsic degrees of freedom, and, the neglect, and that neglecting these will lead to a description of the universe that is fundamentally incomplete. What if our perceptions are as real, or maybe in a certain sense are even more real than material objects? The standard assumption is that consciousness, just like space-time, before the invention of general relativity, plays a secondary subservient role being just a function of matter 
and a tool for the description of the truly existing material world. But let us remember that our knowledge of the world begins not with matter, but with perceptions. And then again, uh, quoting um, Donald Hoffman, this cognitive scientist. And he's, for many years, he was doing, like everyone else in his field, trying to work out how conscious experience can come from brain activity um, unsuccessfully. And now he's completely flipped the other way. He's trying to work out or find or determine how uh, matter can come from consciousness. So this is what he's saying. As a conscious realist, I am postulating conscious experiences as ontological primitives, the most basic ingredients of the world. I'm claiming that experiences are the real coin of the realm. The experiences of everyday life, my real feeling of a headache, my real taste of chocolate, that really is the ultimate nature of reality. I believe that consciousness and its contents are all that exists. Space-time, matter and fields never were the fundamental denizens of the universe, but have always been, from their very beginning, among the humbler contents of consciousness, dependent on it for their very being. So while neuroscientists struggle to understand how there can be such a thing as first-person reality, quantum physicists have to grapple with the mystery of how there can be anything but a first-person reality. And I can really, uh, I can really recommend uh, Donald Hoffman. He has a lot of good talks on, on, on YouTube and so forth. But in particular, one talk uh, I find very, very compelling and very interesting is called The, the Case Against Reality. In fact, he's written a book called The Case Against Reality, basically saying how we don't see reality as it is. And um, if you Google it, he, there's a, uh, this, a case against reality. There's a number of talks he gave titled that. Um, very, very interesting. And the one in particular, he's given a number of different talks on that, but there's, a, there's one particular talk or, uh, longer. He talks for nearly an hour and a half or more and I find it very, very interesting, a lot of things he's got to say. And so if you're interested, um, I put a link on my website, on my front page to that talk. And I think you'll find it very interesting. And one of the things he's really doing now, like I said, in his field of cognitive science, he's a bit of a heretic because you know, they're all mostly a materialist. And he had also for many years tried to work out how conscious experience can arise from brain activity. And now what he's trying to do with some mathematicians is trying to mathematically model the mind and trying to see how uh, quantum mechanics comes from consciousness. That's what he's trying to work on at the moment. So very interesting. So that's the first one. What is the mind? Where does it come from? Where does the mind come from? And to talk about this, uh, we can begin by uh, talking about a little bit about the physical world. Where does the physical world come from? And of course, the most common theory about the origins of the universe is the Big Bang Theory. But then we can ask a, a, a slightly different question. What about the beginning of matter and energy? Because one of the fundamental principles of classical physics is you can't create or destroy matter or energy. You can only transform it. So even though we can talk about the beginning of a universe in terms of a Big Bang, what about the beginning of matter and energy itself? According to classical physics, then actually there, it has no beginning because you can't create it, you can't destroy it. 